through May, um, uh, is the third section, or as we like to call it, the leg of the catechism of the Catholic Church. And that section is entitled Life in Christ. Um, and uh, it builds on the other two sections that uh, many of you have already studied, but if not, I will hopefully fill in some of the blanks tonight. So let's begin tonight, um, uh, because the Life in Christ study, uh, a large emphasis is on the commandments and the Beatitudes. So let's begin tonight with a reading from Psalm 119. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who comply with his testimonies and seek him with all their heart. They also do no injustice, they walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we are to keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I will not be ashamed when I look at all your commandments. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us so much as to give us the directions and the ways in which we are to lead our life so that we might live the life in you, in your Son, Jesus the Christ. Please bless us this night as we study and um, open our hearts and minds to your word and your truth. And we ask all this as we do all things, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the truth of who we are as human beings made in the image of and likeness of God is the beginning of our study of life in Christ. And it's interesting because this is the third section, as I mentioned, or leg of the catechism. And in the first section, there was quite an extensive study about who we are made in the image and likeness of God. So the question has to be, has to be asked. Uh, why does the catechism go back again, even though more briefly, but go back again on who we are made in the image and likeness of Christ? And it's necessary to understand how God made us if we are to understand our vocation. And by that I mean by what we are called to do. Our vocation as a human person and how we are to live the life that God calls us to. The Catechism tells us in 1703, endowed with a spiritual and immortal soul, the human person is the only creature on earth that God has willed for his own sake. From, this, from his uh, conception, he is destined for eternal beatitude. Okay, so what does this mean? That God endowed us with a spiritual immortal soul distinct and different from the rest of his creation. Although angels have immortal souls, they did not have, um, uh, they have spiritual souls rather, um, but the rest of creation does not have an immortal soul. Although we could speak of the life-giving uh, quality of uh, the rest of creation, such as dogs or cats, as a, a soul, it's not an immortal soul. So the word, as we're using it, is immortal. That means it's to live forever. So God gave us a soul uh, created in his image and likeness that we were created to live forever. And the human person is the only creature on earth that God has willed for his, his own sake. And what does that mean? It means that the rest of creation was intended to serve us and to bless God. But we were created for ourselves. Speak out of love, God created us and created us to love him. And so we are cre created for us, the rest of creation, to serve us. From his conception, man was born for eternal beatitude. That means to live forever uh, in Christ's blessedness, 
beatitude, meaning blessedness. So in this world, certainly, absolutely, and forever in heaven, hopefully. Thus, we must turn to the study of the creation of man, which again was found initially in the first section of the catechism, and renew our understanding of what it means to be created in the image of God. That a study, by the way, answers many, many questions, and perhaps you'll think of some of them as I go through. But just even when we talk from that initial quote about destined for himself, says a lot about the, the um, uh, value of human persons as opposed to the value of the rest of creation. And that's very important in this day and age because we're very confused in our society about these things. And there are many other things that I think will shed light on some of the confusions that the world has about the value and the understanding of God as we go along. So I gave you a fill in the blank. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not for everything, but for the essential pieces. And so here's your first one. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Speaks to our society today, yes. And man occupies, Catechism 356, occupies a unique place in creation. Unique. And man, here's your second fill in the blank, man is the summit of God's creation. That's Catechism 343. So the summit, the highest peak that, we, that God could ascend to in terms of his creation is man. He sits at the top of that creation. So the only creature on earth that God has willed for his own sake, he alone is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. Catechism 356. One single person is worth more than the whole the rest of creation combined. So when we save the baby whales and we kill the baby humans, we have a problem. We have a real problem. Jesus tells that the gaining the whole world is not a prize equal to that in value of the man's of the worth of a man's soul. So we are persons called to enter into relationship with God, the Trinity. We are able to enter into this relation freely, relationship freely and deeply as no other creature on earth can. For number three is your next fill in the blank. Man possesses an immortal soul. The immortal soul or the spiritual principle exists in, that exists in man. It can have its origin only in God. So at the moment of conception, the mother and father provide the physical body of a new human person, of their child. But God puts at the moment of conception a spiritual, immortal soul into that person. So at the moment of conception, there is human life with a soul that is intended to live forever in heaven and was created for that. It is the soul which is, and I quote from uh, Catechism between 362 and 364, the innermost aspect of man, that of which is the greatest value in him, that by which he is the most specially made in God's image. So when we say we're made in the image and likeness of God, one of the things that we mean right away, it, it, and especially, is that we possess an immortal soul, a soul that is intended and created to live forever. Being made in the image of God, man is capable, and here's your next fill in the blank, of knowing, loving, and freely choosing. Of all the creatures on earth, these capacities are unique to man and are a function of his soul. So what are the qualities of our soul that we can in with our soul we can know we can love and we can freely choose you can understand 
how God creating us out of his love to enter into his love, he had to create us in this manner because love can't be forced. It has to be chosen, doesn't it? We all know that in all our relationships. So we must be able to know love and freely choose, and those are the qualities of our soul. And also we image God as a communion of persons. When we think of the Trinity, we think of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in loving communion with one another, pouring out love on the other, so much so that the Father pours out the love and we have the Son, and the Son and the Father's love brings us the Spirit, although they're eternal, co-eternal. And so, too, it is that God calls us into communion, a communion with him and a communion with one another. So we can enter into interpersonal relationships based on self-giving love because we have souls. And I quote, the Lord Jesus implied a certain likeness between the union of the divine persons and the unity of God's sons in truth and charity. This likeness reveals that man, who is the only creature on earth which God willed for itself, cannot find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. I remember when I read this document, it comes from one of the documents, that quote comes from one of the documents from Vatican II, um, although I think it is quoted in the catechism as a footnote as well, but I'm, I have to check on that. But it is from one of the documents, uh, Gare Mespez. And um, when I read that many years ago, I was a young mother, in my early 20s, and um, it really struck me and meant a lot to me in terms of how to live my life, because if we think about it, we are the only creature that we cannot find ourselves unless we make a sincere gift of ourselves to others. So he who loses his life shall find it, right? So as we lose our life, in love for another, and we choose others first, God, of course, first, and then the others, husband, wife, parents, children, friends. We choose that. This is where the key to knowing ourselves really lies. And that made a big difference in my life. It helped me to see that it was worth investing and giving. Whether love was returned as I thought it should or not, it was wonderful to know that the gift of what, coming to know myself was in giving myself away. And every spiritual soul is created immediately by God. It is not created by the parents, as we said, and that's from Catechism 366. So that's what our immortal soul is like. And as human persons, with an immortal soul, God created us with what we call original holiness and justice. These are terms that we use a lot, but they're important terms, and I think if, even if we don't remember the term themselves, we certainly should remember the meaning of them. The Catechism tells us that the first man was created not only good, but in also established in friendship with his creator and in harmony with himself and with the creation around him in a state that would be surpassed only by the glory of the new creation in Christ. So we recreated good, but in friendship with God, in harmony with myself and with those around me, including creation. So the lion and the, and the viper did not hurt man. Work did not hurt man. It was his joy. They, there was no argument between Adam and Eve. And they walked and talked in the garden with God in friendship, right? So this is how God created mankind. So original holiness, when we speak of that, we mean specifically a participation of the divine life of God. Man was created, in other words, in the state of sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is defined as that very life of God himself. And we receive that first as fallen mankind since the time of Adam and Eve, 
um, we receive that at our baptism initially. So we are filled with sanctifying grace. And every time we receive the sacraments, we receive more sanctifying grace, which is why Father Mo is always telling us it's so important to receive the sacraments because that's where we get this divine life of God filled and refilled in our lives. And you can't fill up. There's always room for more grace. So that's what original holiness was, created with sanctifying grace in his soul, Adam and Eve. Because of this divine intimacy that existed in man's life, he would not have to experience suffering or death. God did not intend death. That was not his plan. That was a result of sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. If there had been no sin, there would not have been any death or suffering. So that's how death came into the world and suffering came into the world. And that sheds some light on those who think, oh, what kind of God could we have who allows such suffering? It's not God does allow it in the sense that we're free to choose sin, but those are the consequences of sin, not of God. So that's a holy, original holiness. What is original justice? Original justice meant that there was harmony within the human person, between man and woman, between the couple, and between all of creation. So that's number six and number seven, okay, for your fill in the blanks. So original holiness is number six, and original justice is number seven. In the state of original holiness and justice, man had mastery over himself and the entire world. Man's will which is a faculty of our soul, had mastery over his flesh, and he was free from the tendency to sin. We are not free from the tendency to sin. We all know that. (laughs) It's easy for us to give in to sin. Um, uh, And we call that concupiscence. It's a big word, concupiscence. It means we have the tendency to sin, again, the result of the original sin of Adam and Eve. And to have harmony and integrity over ourselves means that I, my will has the power over the rest of my passions, okay? So I don't have to eat that extra piece of chocolate that isn't good for me. Um, and I'm not tempted to if I have harmony, okay? We are tempted now, at least I am. <laughs> and we're all tempted towards something. <laughs> And work was a willing collaboration of man and woman with God. It was man's pleasure to work as God's stewards uh, in perfecting the material world. Again, all a part of original justice. So those are the aspects of original holiness and justice. Then we read in uh, Genesis uh, 3.6, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband. This is the original sin, what we call original sin. God created man in his image and established him in his friendship. A spiritual creature, man can live this friendship only in free submission to God. Obviously, Adam and Eve were not submitting to God's plan. He told them there was one tree that they couldn't eat from, and that was the tree that they had to believe that God was holding out on them somehow, that they had a better plan, that Satan tempted them, and they believed him instead of believing God. They let trust in their Savior, in their God, die in their hearts, the Catechism tells us. So knowing that there was going to be a great price for the freedom that he was required to give us, God willingly paid the price. So God wasn't surprised by Adam and Eve's sin um, because God knows all things, and he knows all things at all times. He sees the beginning from the end to the end at once. And so he knew that Adam and Eve would sin, and yet he still wanted to create them free because he wanted to create them, and he did in love. Sin and death entered the world because of original sin, and that's number eight. 
Number nine is the personal sin of Adam and Eve resulted in the rest of mankind being born without the divine life of God in their souls. So when we are born, uh, we do not have sanctifying grace in our soul because of original sin. We are all born without it. Thus the need, the terrible need, the incredible need for baptism in which original sin is forgiven and the divine life of God, sanctifying grace, fills our souls once again. Thus, sin at, committed at the beginning of human, this sin committed at the beginning of human history is called original sin. And that's all part of number, number nine for you. And what were the consequences? Well, we've mentioned some of those already. Original sin resulted in the loss of original holiness and justice. Man was born without divine life of grace in his soul and locked in a lifetime of struggle to rightly order his will in his passions. And we know that if we just look into our own lives. We struggle. If we're we're trying to live a life uh, pleasing to God, we are constantly struggling uh, to to have our will reign over our passions. Human nature now tends towards sin, concupiscence. The union of man and woman is now subject to tensions, their relations subject to lust and dominion. Man's harmony with creation is broken. The material world is hostile to man. Suffering and toil are now part of human existence, and death enters the world. From the moment of original sin until the end of time, mankind lives in a dramatic tension. This is from Catechism 409. The whole of man's history has been the story of dour combat with the powers of evil, stretching, so our Lord tells us, from the very dawn of history until the last day. Finding himself in the midst of the battlefield, man has to struggle to do what is right, and it is at great cost to himself, and aided by God's grace, that he succeeds in achieving his own inner integrity. End of quote. Thus, we must choose to follow Christ. All this leads up to this point that the Catechism wants to get to as it launches into a study of life in Christ, is that we must choose to follow Christ. We must use our will to to knowingly and fully choose to say yes to God. We were made for heaven. Um, So number 11, we must choose to follow Christ, okay? We were made for heaven and we find our fulfillment in seeking and loving what is good. And yet we often desire to choose our own way, the way of darkness and death. The gospel presents the struggle to us in the parable of the two ways. And here's the rest of your quote. One way leads to life, the other leads to destruction. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, and I quote, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. When we say leads to life, we mean life in Christ, right? So we must choose, and we are destined for heaven. That is God's plan for us, to live eternally with him. We will live eternally one way or another, uh, one place or another. Where we live eternally is our choice. We'll either live in heaven if we choose God, or we will live in hell, eternally in hell, if we choose, don't choose God. And by that, we could say it even more clearly. If we die with a sanctifying grace, the very life of God himself in our soul, to heaven we shall go, as Frank Sheed says. And if not, then we will suffer eternally in hell. Okay? So it's pretty clear. So it's important for us to understand the plan God has. And God gave us the commandments because like a great maker, he sent the instructions, the operating instructions, right? Right? 
if we were to buy something, I'm sure we all look out, okay, how do I clean this thing or how do I care for it? What does it require in order for it to work properly? Well, God sent those things for us as well, in part be, through the, the, the um, I'm here, the Ten Commandments, and uh, also through the Beatitudes and the study and growth in the life of virtue. So number 12 for you is the Beatitudes reveal the goal of human existence, the ultimate end of human acts. God calls us to his own beatitude. So beatitude is your fill-in for number 12. When we say uh, beatitude, we often think, as I did the first time I saw the term used in this way, of the Sermon on the Mount, where in Matthew's Gospel we read Jesus about Jesus going up to the mountain and preaching a wonderful sermon, a sermon uh, that has many paradoxes to it. Um, those who lose their life shall gain it. <laughs> those who weep shall be joyful. So many paradoxes and yet the fulfillment, so to speak, of the Beatitudes. But it means something broader than that. It certainly means that, but it means the blessedness of God once again. So he, God calls us to his own, into his own blessedness. In other words, to live with him in this life and then to live with him forever in heaven. God put us in the world to know, to love, and to serve him. Um, and thus, that's what we are called in this part of our journey. Remember, this is, St. Therese says, the world is your ship, not your home. I love that. The world is your ship not your home. In other words, we're in a journey, and the journey is towards eternal life. This life is a ship. It's not all there is at all. It's only the beginning. Heaven is the ultimate and, fulfill, ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme and definitive happiness. Catechism 10.24. So the beatitude of God, as we said, is the goal of human existence. Heaven is the place God made for us to spend eternity with him in Trinitarian life. Remember, God is in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and they are a communion of persons loving one another. God has invited us into that here and ultimately forever with him in heaven. So what does the beatitude of God mean? Well, first it means heaven. <laughs> but what does that look like? Well, we have many things that help us to know. No one can know for sure because we haven't been there yet. But it means the coming of the kingdom of God. So this is the beginning of 13, and there's a number of fill-ins for you. Matthew 4, 4, 17. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So the beatitude of God means come, the coming of the kingdom of God. The vision of God. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Entering into next the joy of the Lord. Matthew 25, 21. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And next, entering into God's rest. From that, we can look at Hebrews 4, 7 through 11, and we see that this is referring to the Sabbath rest, the rest of God. If you recall, in creation on the seventh day, God did what? He rested, <laughs> and we call that the Sabbath, which is why we are called to make it holy, because God wants us to rest. He doesn't want us to work 24-7. He wants us to rest because he knows that that's what he's created us for. And so we enter into God's rest, the, seat, the Sabbath rest. St. Augustine says, as, and he's quoted in the Catechism in 1720, there we shall rest and see, we shall see and love, we shall love and praise. 
Behold, what will be at the end without end? For what other end do we have if not to reach the kingdom which has no end? I, I tell a story about uh, our former pastor, Father Mark Montmany. Many of you probably know Father Mark. And if you know him or knew him, he uh, is in Salem now, a pastor in Salem. He is a workaholic, if I've ever met one. I tend to be that myself, and he's a workaholic. And one day he told me, I was on staff at the time, and one day he said to me, um, when I get to heaven, I'm going to work, work, work. And I said, well, good for you, Father Mark. When I get to heaven, I'm going to rest, rest, rest. <laughs> and I think I chose the better part. <laughs> um, so I teased him about that. So there we are, the joy of the Lord and the rest of the Lord. So how, what are the paths to the kingdom of heaven? How do we get there? Well, the Lord has left us clear instructions. The paths to true and eternal happiness are the Decalogue and the Beatitudes. That's your number 14. And I need for you to fill in a blank that I forgot, which is the apostolic teaching. Another word to say that is the teaching of the church the teaching magisterium of the church, okay, the teachings. So the Decalogue, the Beatitudes, and the apostolic teaching are your fill-ins. What is the Decalogue? Well, usually when we, when we say that, we mean the Ten Commandments. The word Decalogue means ten words, and that's number 15, along with the second part of it. It is part of divine revelation. It is also a privileged part of the natural law. That's the second part of the fill-in for you. It is engraved by God in the human heart. So in the Ten Commandments, when Moses went out onto the mountain to meet with God and he came down with the tablets on which were written the Ten Commandments, um, they were a... a expression, uh, excuse me, they were engraved kind of on these tablets as God's gift to mankind. But these laws, these Ten Commandments were already written on man's heart. So when we say it's part of the natural law, we are saying that these commandments, God created mankind to know. That's who God created us to be. You don't need divine revelation, meaning you don't need God to tell you that it's wrong to kill we were created that way. We know it. To honor our parents, we were created that way. We know that. Oh, if you look at the Ten Commandments, they are in our heart, and that's what we mean by natural law, that they are a privileged part of that, the way God created us. And yet, God made it even clearer by giving us what we call, the, through divine revelation, through his revealing to us, the Ten Commandments themselves, on tablets of stone. So we have them written out, and we learned them as children, um, and if we didn't, we should have, um, and it's never too late, um, and uh, we can find them in the Catechism. So uh, those are the Decalogue. They are commands, are God's gift to his people, revealing his holy will. In revealing that, he also reveals himself. So if we look at the Ten Commandments, we can see the heart of God, right? What he wants and what he doesn't want. First of the ten words recall how God loved his people first. And then the rest are more uh, are, uh, about how we treat one another. Always understood in the light of the covenant. So these are always understood in the light of a relationship that God has made with his people. He made it in the Old Testament, we call that the Old Covenant, and he renewed it in the New Testament in Jesus Christ, a new covenant with the bond of his blood, his blood at the cost of his blood. He made an agreement with us that he would keep his word and that we need to enter into that. So it's always in a loving, the sense of God's loving us, Moral existence, meaning the right from living or the right life, is a response to God's loving initiative. In number 16, for your fill in the blanks, the commandments are obligatory 
for Christians. Catechism 2068, they are of grave matter. So if you want to know what mortal sin, what kinds of things mortal sin, go to the Ten Commandments. Obviously, there are other uh, specifications that have to be part of uh, a sin to make it mortal, and we can, you can, I can answer that if you have a question about it at the end. But um, they are what constitutes grave matter. In other words, these are serious. Keep holy the Lord's day for us, meaning come to Mass on Sunday, is a grave sin if we do not. They are obligatory for us. Christ did not do away with the commandments. He unfolded their commands, their demands. So if we look at the Beatitudes, that's where we see the unfolding of that. Um, And following the commandments will require a personal response. In Matthew um, 19, 16 through 22, we read the story of the poor young man, um, the rich young man, rather, who came to see Jesus, and he said, Jesus, what must I do to earn eternal life, to get eternal life? Jesus said, you must follow the commandments. He said, I've done this all my life. And Jesus didn't say, okay, you're done. (laughs) He said, well, sell all you have and give to the poor. But it requires a personal response. And what happened? The young man turned away and walked away because he had many possessions. And so, yes, the commandments are important. But also important is to see, is there something in our life that we are placing before God? It doesn't mean we all have to sell all our belongings. Maybe some of us are called to that. But we are all called to give up something we want, we have, we desire in order to please God. And we need to talk to God about that, and he will show us. He always does. He's true to show us if we ask him. So it requires a personal response. Number 17, um, we find the Beatitudes in the Sermon of the Mount. Okay, that's your fill-in. That's in chapter 5 of Matthew. They are at the heart of Jesus' preaching. They show, they meaning the Beatitudes, show us our vocation. In other words, how we are to live. Vocation here does not necessarily mean to become a priest or a sister um, or a husband or a wife. It means to become a son or a daughter of God. What does it mean as sons and daughters of God? How is it that we are to live our life They are paradoxical promises that sustain hope in the midst of tribulation. Blessed are those who hunger and and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. In other words, all we have to do is hunger and thirst to be in right relationship with God, and he will fill us, but we have to do the hungering and thirsting. They shed light on the attitudes and actions of the Christian life. And they tell us of blessings and promises that are already belong to disciples of Christ, if only in a dim way. In other words, the joy of living in the Lord and of loving the Lord and living in his beatitude, his blessedness, is for here as well as for eternity, even if only dimly. Yes, we can shed tears, but we can have joy in our hearts if we follow Christ. That's one of those paradoxes. Number 18, for you, the Beatitudes respond to the natural desire for happiness. God wants us to be happy. He created us to be happy, but not happy in the way the world uses that word. Happy, like I get whatever I want and I do whatever I want. I do what makes me happy. You be happy and I'll be happy and no. God designs what happiness is. He created us for that. And when we truly, and the saints really knew this, when they truly gave up all they had in order to follow him, they knew deep happiness in this world. Can you imagine what that happiness will be when we get to live with him forever in heaven? Praise God, we will. This desire is of divine origin, this desire for happiness. God has placed it in the human heart in order to draw us to the one who can fulfill it. 
God himself. St. Augustine said so beautifully, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. God made us for himself. And so the world, and we often hear this in testimonies of people who have given their life to Christ after they tried everything. They tried whatever you can imagine the world has to offer, and then some. And yet they were still restless. And many of those people in the, we see in the front pages of the, the papers and the news who seem to have everything, fame, money, clothes, whatever, they end up taking their life because there's no happiness in it. But when we find the Lord, then we find that peace. Then we find that happiness until our hearts rest in thee. Number 19 in the end here, it is the Beatitudes, uh, excuse me, the greatest commandment, okay, is the word greatest. And I quote, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So first of all, we must love God with all that we have. And second, then we must love our neighbor. And who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is anyone that God puts in our path. We remember the story of the Samaritan, who the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along at all, and yet it was the Samaritan, not the Jewish leaders, who stopped to help the man on the side of the road, remember? It was the Samaritan who stopped to help. And in the common sense of the word neighbor, he certainly wasn't a neighbor. He wasn't even, they weren't even friends with one another. The countries were not friendly with one another. The, um, they didn't even want Christ to enter their city when he came through Samaria. Okay? But he was the neighbor, and the man knew it, and he knew it in his heart, and so will we, whether it's our husband, our wife, our children, our friends, the stranger that God calls us to reach out to. Those are our neighbors, and we must love them as we love ourselves. Taken from um, a last quote here, in, we find in the Catechism, but it's taken from a sermon by St. Leo the Great. It says, Christian, recognize your dignity, and now that you share in God's own nature, do not return to your former base condition by sinning. Remember who is your head and who of whose body you are a member. Never forget that you've been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God. Through our baptism, we have entered the kingdom of God. And as long as our soul has grace in it, and if it doesn't, then we need to get to the sacrament of reconciliation and restore that grace. And once it's restored, every time we go to Holy Communion after that, as long as we stay in the state of grace, that grace grows in us, and it gets harder and harder to sin. It gets harder and harder to fall back into the old ways. It gets easier and easier, not that it's ever easy, but it gets easier and easier to walk in God's ways because God created us for that. So we have good and evil, light and darkness, life and death. These are the paradoxes if you read from the Old Testament through to the end of the book of Revelation. We see this battle between light and darkness and good and evil, life and death. In Deuteronomy, Moses spoke, and um, he said, given to him by God, he wrote this, and this is how I'd like to close tonight, and then I'll take questions and answers. This day... I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Your questions. We left a lot of things kind of open there, so there's time now to answer questions if they would like clarification on any of it. or Yeah. Number five. Maybe I missed it for you. Sorry. The first man was not only created good. Okay, at the end of it is original holiness and justice. Original holiness and justice. Number six is original holiness. And number seven is original justice. So the first time they appear together, because they're two different things, then they appear separately describing what... Uh, original holiness is and what original justice is. So that's five, six, and seven. Any questions? You're very quiet. Yes. Okay. Friendship with God, yeah. And so we have this big battle going on. Right. Right. So then why did Adam and Eve sin? You know, that's a good question. Right, because they didn't have that tendency to sin, that concupiscence. So they didn't have the tendency to sin, and so the question is why. But I think, I think although it's not spelled out to us so clearly, I think if we understand what surrounds it, we can see that Satan uh, is out to seek and destroy, and he was certainly out to seek and destroy Adam and Eve in their relationship with God, and his, his, he's powerful. Um, as Christians, with God living within us, we don't have to fear that, but he has power. And, and Adam and Eve knew that, and they knew uh, what God had given them, and they, but they did have free will. And so that powerful temptation, they still were free to say yes or no. They didn't have the tendency towards it. It was more difficult for them to do that. You're right. And that does leave us kind of in a mystery. How come? Because they really made a mess of things, you know? No, they didn't because they were, weren't born with concupiscence, so there was no tendency to sin. Right. Yes. Right, exactly. Satan as the serpent in the form of a serpent. It was Satan who convinced her to eat of the apple and then give it to her husband. You're right. Yep. And so death entered the world and all the consequences, original holiness and justice was lost and all the rest of it. But it does shed some light on some of the big questions because a lot of people ask, well, uh, if your God is so good, how come all these things happen? Well, they happen because men, mankind chooses evil and, and there are consequences to our choices. So consequences of Adam and Eve's choice, although we don't, it says it's mysterious how it was passed on, but the consequences of Adam and Eve's choice uh, to sin and to uh, what we call the original sin or original sin is passed on to us. It's not, it's contracted by us. It's not our sin. We didn't commit it, but it is contracted to us because of our human nature. So from Adam and Eve on, everyone was born without original sin, with original sin in their soul, rather. Also, the other thing that I didn't mention, because it doesn't play in as much here, but um, the um, gates of heaven were closed, whereas before God walked, he, the, uh, Adam and Eve walked with God in friendship in the garden, but the gates of heaven were closed then. And we see that 
Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden and there were angels with flaming swords kept there. And the gates of heaven were not opened again until Christ died on the cross and rose. And, and because that was the fulfillment of what needed to happen to erase that sin. So all those who died before Christ completed his uh, saving act uh, waited for Christ. They, aren't, they weren't in heaven then. They were waiting. We call it Sheol, the place of the dead. Um, not hell, but a place of the dead, waiting for Christ to come and to um, open the gates of heaven so they could then be with him in heaven. So those who died as his friends is the way it's phrased, uh, waited for him. So that was another consequence of original sin. Other questions or comments? No? Well, go in peace. Thank you very much.